I am Dr. Erica Cesari. I am a science fellow for Bush Heritage Australia. I'm based out of Hamlin Station in Shark Bay, Western Australia, and I did my PhD on the Hamlin Pool stromatolites. What is a stromatolite? The technical definition for a stromatolite is an organosedimentary deposit that accretes by the trapping and binding of microorganisms or the precipitation of calcium carbonate through metabolic processes. Okay, so how does um, a stromatolite accrete? So this is actually a model from the research initiative on bohemian stromatolites. And this is a picture of a stromatolite, a cross section, you can see the lamination. And then the little white box on this stromatolite, you can see off to the left hand side. And the modeled bits are uh, trapped and bound sediments, those are sediments, and the blue lines represent um, macritic lamination. So laminations made of cement created by microbes. And at the surface of the stromatolite, you can see that there's a bit of a microbial mat. And each interior lamination on the stromatolite is evidence of a former surface mat. And that mat is made up of microbes. And if you look over to the right hand side, you can see filamentous cyanobacteria. In the top picture, they're little green ones. And in the bottom picture, you can see they're little filament. They're wrapped around these blue grains. So those are the sediments. So you can see how they kind of trap them there in the surface. And the microbes are photosynthesizers. So they want to take their energy from the sun. And if the sediments are covering them, they want to get to the top of the sediments. So they kind of creep up on top of the grains and bind the grains down so that they're at the surface again and can photosynthesize. But I think one of the most important things that we need to remember about stromatolites is that they're actually trace fossils. In the upper right hand corner, you've got um, a dinosaur footprint and that's to remind us that a stromatolite is a trace fossil. So like the dinosaur footprint, it's not actually fossil evidence. It's not actually a bone. It's not it's not part of the dinosaur. It's a footprint that's evidence the dinosaur was once there. In the same way, these laminations and stromatolites are actually evidence that the microbial community was once there. Something like 1% of known stromatolites have bacteria that's actually entombed as a fossil. So more than not, you just find the laminations in the stromatolite, and those laminations are evidence of a former surface mat. So the next point that I want to touch on is why are stromatolites important to Earth's evolutionary history? Um, so if we think about Earth um, in terms of this diagram, this is a diagram that's been modified by Dave Demeray. You've got the different breakout periods. You've got the Hadean, which is the beginning part of Earth's history, and this is a time when Earth is beginning its formation, and that's about 4.5 billion years ago. And it's this really hot hell. During the later part of the Hadean, you've got um, you've got impacts hitting the Earth all the time, basically evaporating all of the water up on the surface. It's like the it's 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 literally hell on Earth. And then after that, the next period is the Archean, and that's a time of plate tectonics and and early Earth starting to form, and then onto the Proterozoic and to the Phanerozoic. And and I think if we add on this next bit, which is kind of uh, life. Here, this is how we, we get here, and th this diagram should actually be modified because there was a new discovery of stromatolites in Greenland in the Ishwa group. The first stromatolites are now dated at 3.7 billion years. Wow. So this diagram still depicts what we did know about stromatolites, which was the, the first fossil evidence of life were in stromatolites um, dated 3.45 billion years ago in the Pilbara in Western Australia. Um, but we actually think life started kind of closer to the beginning of the Archean, but we just don't have any fossil record of that. So the first fossil evidence that we have comes in the form of stromatolites, and that's now at about 3.7 billion years. And then move forward in time, and we start to get more complex organisms in the Proterozoic, and near the end of the Proterozoic, we get um, algae and things like that. But it's not until the Cambrian explosion, which is right where you see the Phanerozoic start to begin, where you get this radiation of life. And if you put this into perspective, if you, s if you stand and put your arm out to the side 
and start time at your nose and move all the way out to the end of your fingertips. If you took a shaving from your fingernail, that is essentially humans. That's our existence on this planet. Now imagine 80% of that period is dominated by microbial life. That is stromatolites. So you've got all of this Earth's history that is nothing in the rock record but stromatolites. And if you look at this little red wedge right in here, that's dinosaurs' existence right in the Mesozoic. And it's so funny because when we think about fossils, what do we think about? What's the first thing that pops to your mind is usually a dinosaur. When really the dominant fossil throughout Earth history are stromatolites. So what is the big deal with stromatolites? Oxygen. The big deal with stromatolites is oxygen. So this is an image um, from a subtitle stromatolite in Hamlin Pool. This is a stromatolite building microbial community that is actively photosynthesizing. And you can see all the little oxygen bubbles coming off the surface. Look at a diagram of early Earth. You have to excuse the simplicity here. But we've got, we've got um, these shallow seas all along the margin. You've got these microbial communities. And in this instance, in this diagram, they're building stromatolites. So you've got the, micro the microbial communities up here, and they're photosynthesizing. And they're putting out free oxygen into the ocean. Now, what happens with this free oxygen is that there's also a lot of free iron ions. And the oxygen and the iron come together and they make often rust, often iron formations, all the banded iron formations. And in Western Australia, where Western Australia's economy is built around iron. And if you go to a bunch of different locations around Australia, you'll see heaps and heaps of these iron formations, banded iron formations. Oh, yeah. And so who can we thank for that? Well, we can thank these um, microbial communities that are photosynthesizing and they're putting out all of that oxygen. So you reach a point when all of that oxygen is used up. It's all been, it, or all that oxygen has reacted with iron, all that free oxygen's reacted with everything it can do. And now we've just got free oxygen out there in the ocean. And the ocean reaches a point where it's saturated with oxygen and it can't hold any more oxygen. And where does that oxygen have to go? Up into the atmosphere. So now we've got billions of years of microbial communities photosynthesizing, saturating the oceans with free oxygen, and then oxygenating the atmosphere. So what was in early Earth a reducing volatile atmosphere with less than 1% oxygen. Now, over millennia, we've changed that to over 20% oxygen. And that change in the atmosphere is basically what allowed for evolution. So when you get to that so what question, you and I would not be sitting here today if it weren't for all that photosynthesizing activity from early microbial mats. Now we get to Hamlin Pool and why the stromatolites in Hamlin Pool are so significant. So if we look at a diagram um, of early Earth, this is uh, after Aramic, the one, the diagram on the right. So this is stromatolites through time. Um, you've got the, the first appearance of them in about three point, now we know, 3.7 billion years. And as you move up the diagram, you're moving up through time to the present. And you can see that as you start to move forward, they increase in abundance and diversity in, throughout the rock record. And then right before the Cambrian explosion, which is at 542 million years ago, you see a sharp decline. And so that's a result of, of higher life. So basically all this oxygen that the, that the microbial communities put out into the atmosphere, which allowed for the evolution of higher life, ultimately snuffed themselves out because when you start to get macroalgae evolving and you start to get higher organisms evolving, you start to create organisms that are better competitors, either for space or they also could be predators. These organisms could be grazing on the microbial communities. So essentially, once you get the more evolved life that's better suited for that environment, 
it kind of snuffs out the microbial communities that build stromatolites until they get pushed back into places where higher organisms can't live. Uh, on the left is a mural at the Smithsonian depicting early Earth. It's painted by P. Sawyer. And you can see the volcanoes and the hot springs and the stromatolites. And then this is uh, the lower left is an image of stromatolites in the rock record. So if you think about that turnip diagram, the Aramic diagram, and, and stromatolites then have that pinch out right at the Cambrian explosion, we didn't know that modern stromatolites existed anymore. And in the 1950s, the first discovery of marine stromatolites was made in Shark Bay, Western Australia by Phil Playford. And then in the mid-1980s, they were found along the margins of the Exuma Sound in the Bahamas. And so those are the two marine formations that we still know of today. And there could be some other ones out there that we just haven't really discovered. In fact, there's also some marine um, stromatolites, but they, they occur in the supertidal zone, so they don't have that active um, interaction with the, with the ocean in South Africa. Um, so why do they exist in Hamlin Pool? Well, think about that turnip diagram again from Aramic, where you start to see that pinch out, where life has evolved and life either outcompetes for space or grazes upon the microbial communities and you see them disappear in the rock record. Well, for that same reason, they exist in Hamlin Pool. Hamlin is a really extreme environment. The average salinity in Hamlin Pool is 66 parts per thousand. Normal ocean salinity is around 35 parts per thousand. So Hamlin has a salinity around twice that of normal, normal ocean water. But the other thing that's interesting about Hamlin Pool is this range of salinity, is that we've captured readings as low as 16 parts per thousand. That's fresher than normal marine salinity. And then even up to 88 parts per thousand, which is really high. Then for temperature, you've got a range from 11 to 33 degrees centigrade over the course of the year. Um, and actually, the average temperature is 22 degrees as well. It cuts right in the middle. But if you think about a coral, a coral can usually live within a range of about 7 degrees centigrade. Um, some corals can maybe live up into a range of about 10 degrees centigrade. But generally, it's around 7. So Think about a temperature range of 22 degrees over the course of a year. So that's a huge temperature range for an organism to have to tolerate. And think about the fact that the organism is fixed. It's a benthic microbial community. It can't move. It can't swim to another location. It's stuck there to bear that temperature range. And then also, you have a tidal variation of around 2 meters over the course of the year. And I say over the course of the year because um, the annual tide is sinuous. Only 20% of the tide is based on astronomical factors. So if you look in a tide book, I can nearly guarantee you that Hamlin will not be doing what that tide book tells you. Because at the northern part of Hamlin Pool, it's barred by the 4 a sill, which is a carbonate um, sand bank. Uh, it's colonized by heaps of seagrasses, and the seagrasses help baffle sediments as they go through. So this, this bank builds over time, and it restricts the water. Only, there's only one major passageway where water can flow through there, and depending on, on who you ask, it's either called Will Succeed Channel or, I think, Harold Loop Channel. I always call it Will Succeed Channel, it, after Joe Spaven's lighter back in the wool days. But... Because of that sill, there's only 20% astronomical forces. Then 20% is due to seasonal changes, and the other 60% is due to meteorological forces. So basically, if you look at what the wind is doing, you can tell pretty much what the tide is going to do that day, because it pushes the water. During one part of the year, you have higher high tides and higher low tides, and that is during the winter months, and during the summer months, you have lower high tides and lower low tides. And that also ties into your salinity fluctuations, which is very interesting. In Hamlin, you have higher salinities in the winter months and lower salinities in the summer months. Now, that's counterintuitive, groundwater intrusion. So 
it's estimated that in Hamlin there are over a hundred million stromatolites that cover nearly the entire 135 kilometers of shoreline. And the yellow arrow here in the image is pointing to flagpole landing. That's where the boardwalk is. That's where the telegraph station is. And that's where the majority of research has been done for the last 50 years. If you go there, sometimes it's not that exciting. And if you don't know what you're looking at, it may be hard to really find that enjoyable. But if you know what they represent, all of a sudden, they become very important. And the other really important thing to think about is how these structures change when you get away from the boardwalk. This is a composite stromatolite. It's massive. This is on a super calm day. You can actually see my shadow standing on the boat in the right-hand corner of the image. And these are basically big stromatolites that have grown in a cluster and they've kind of started to join together. And the fringe that you see along the margins is macroalgae. And that's um, just off Carbola Point. So these are on the east side in deeper waters. Uh, this is also on the east side further up. They're like tabular stromatolites that kind of all fit into one another. So those grooves are really caused by currents, uh, water direction, and the the elongation is perpendicular to shore. And then also you can see that there's macroalgae growing along the sides of it. But these stromatolites in slide 21, these stromatolites are on the western side of the pool, just beyond one of the, uh, just, just south of Snake Bank, which is the long promontory that protrudes there from the, from the western margin. And you just get heaps of these big platforms. These are seep stromatolites, and this is a really low tide day on the southwestern margin. And these lines of stromatolites extend for kilometers. And they're not parallel to shore, they're sub-parallel to shore. They're in a north-south direction, so they line up with the dominant wind direction for the year. There are lobes on the shore-facing side of the stromatolites that are perpendicular to shore, so in the direction of wave translation. So basically the waves that come in cut those fingers out and then the winds cause them to line up in the long lines. And you can also see in that slide that there was, there's a really low gradient as you go out. So imagine that with over two meters, you've got that two meter tidal change over the course of the year. So at one time of the year, you can imagine that those stromatolites are covered nearly every day or every day they get wet. And at another time of the year, they may be exposed for quite a long period of time. That's part of the extreme environment. These stromatolites, they are off Carbola Point. These are composite stromatolites. And they, are, they have this really macritic texture. So there's not a lot of trapped and bound sediment here. They're actually just this macritic framework. They're really interesting. So frameworks made by microbes. And they, they have a lot of macroalgae around the sides of them. And they're often bladed. And so they've got these like lobes that are in the direction towards shore. These are some of my favorite stromatolites. These I call elongate nested. And this type of stromatolite is found to the south of every promontory on the west side. And they just form these gorgeous, sometimes they're very low, like 10 to 20 centimeters in relief. And then in other areas, they can get up to, to 40 centimeters in relief. Beautiful elongations. They tend to be on the southern side of the promontories. And the elongations are in the direction of shore but it's right where that wave comes in to cut and turn at the promontory, and so that is a really strong current. And then that's a positive feedback loop, so that then will build up in that shape over time. These are the traditional stromatolites that we think about, these dome shapes, and you can see some of the fish that do live in there as well. And then here, these are some of the much taller ones. These are probably around 40 centimeters in relief. And these are also these elongate nested stromatolites. So these are up on the northwest side um, below the Anchorage promontory. And here, these are more classic kind of stromatolites, that, that kind of column. But these stromatolites, you can see, have started to really flatten out and give it another 100 years. They'll probably all be connected 
into merged into one big stromatolite because they've started to flatten. When the stromatolite grows up, these microbial communities they get out of the range that's that's their proper growth range. So instead of growing up higher, then they want to spread out a bit more so they can have more surface area to photosynthesize. And when they start to spread out, then often they touch one another and they merge into one structure. And then that mat will kind of cover everything and make it one structure. And these stromatolites are just little teeny tiny baby stromatolites. They're maybe 10 to 20 centimeters in height. And there's just a new little nursery of stromatolites growing. So that's just kind of a, a touch of the different types of structures in there. And modern stromatolites were often believed to be not good analogs to ancient stromatolites because they're often so grainy. They trap and bind all these grains. And that is true. Stromatolites and hamlin are often composed of trapped and bound grains. But these microbial communities build their own cement frameworks. So in this slide, we'll talk about understanding early Earth. And now Hamlin helps us do that. First, on the left-hand side is structure. In the top left, these are around 2 billion year old stromatolites from Great Slave Lake in Canada. And in the bottom picture, these are elongate nested stromatolites actively growing and accreting in Hamlin Pool. And you can see how that structure is very similar. So you can think about measuring in the modern the current, which direction it's going, and from that information you can imply what's happened in the ancient. This, the middle column is internal fabric. This is a 600 million year old internal fabric from a stromatolite in the Pilbara. The bottom row is an internal fabric from a modern Hamlin pool stromatolite. You can see that it's, it's not really grainy, it's got that internal Mercritic framework, very similar to a 600 million year old stromatolite. And in the final column, we've got the biology. In the top right, nearly a 2 billion year old fossilized microbial community from a stromatolite. This microbe is Aoentophysalis. Now, in the next row, in the modern, this is an image of a bacteria that dominates nearly every single microbial community in Hamlin. It's Antiphysalis. That is the same microbial lineage. Hamlin is virtually a window to early Earth. Other applications for Hamlin pool stromatolites, and this is quite controversial, are looking for life outside of Earth. Now, microbial communities can often make what we call a biosignature. So stromatolites can be viewed as a biosignature. What does that mean? Well, in the images you just saw, there were a bunch of different shapes of stromatolites. So if you can predict or analyze that shape, then you've got the microbes making a signature in the rock record that sometimes predictable. So if you saw that shape somewhere else on another planet, say, then you know that you can hone in to that rock structure and that maybe you might find evidence of life there. So it's about looking at the microbial community, looking at what type of structure that microbial community is making. And if that structure makes a certain pattern, that then you can find somewhere else. So if you're looking for life on another planet, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. However, if you know what the structure you're looking for looks like, it makes that haystack much, much smaller.